quick pop quiz. You finally got around to automating your laundry and added light strips in the kitchen. You use four different colors for the various states of your washer and dryer. What smart home heuristic is applicable? A. Fail safe. B. Anti ambiguous. The answer is B, anti-ambiguous, but I'm sure you knew that. Okay, how about this one? Once an hour, when anyone enters your bedroom, your smart home speakers announces which devices are offline. You have a spouse. How do you fix this? A, send notifications to your phone. B, announce when you specifically walk into their room. C, beg for forgiveness. D, both A and B. The answer is D, both A and B. Okay, okay, last one, last one. You have an automation that toggles your smart light bulb in the hallway when it's dark. As you walk down the hallway one night, the lights don't turn on and you step on a Lego, causing you to crumple to the floor in pain and disgrace. What do you do? A, hang the shame curtains. B, wish you installed a car's FP2 fall detection. C, install a smart switch instead. The answer is D. Wonder where the Lego came from since you live alone. Okay, I hope you all passed. When I started deep diving into home automation, I was surprised by how easy it was to get started. And I bet you probably felt the same. The deeper you go, the more complex tricks you learn, like using NFCs to trigger automations or sending notifications based on complex series of actions or even using lights as statuses. But you know what else I noticed? It was only me using these automations. My wife couldn't care less. And I bet it's probably the same for a lot of you. And if I were to take a guess for about every Every 10 automations you create, your family maybe interacts with maybe at most three. And if you can get them to use five out of the 10, bro, you're a god amongst men. But this then begs the question, how good is your automation if you're the only one that use it or benefits from it? So I spent a year observing how my family interacted with the automations I created. And I looked at blogs, videos, and feedback and comments from a whole bunch of other folks just to gain their experiences. And this led to the creation of the smart home user experience heuristic. Now, it's started off as a list of five principles, but after battle testing it against real world automations and sanity testing it with the Discord squad, the list started to evolve. Now you may ask yourself, who are you? Why should I follow these made up rules? Bro, to take it to another level, that's why. Story time. After I created the heuristics, I wanted to test it against both well-known and obscure automations to see what would happen, but it handles most well-known automations fine because, well, it was based off of many well-known automations and their shortcomings, so I needed more niche automations to test it against. Enter Reed from Smart Home Solver. He posted a video showing about 10 automations for 2024, and one of the automations caught my attention. When we're watching TV, adjusting the lights is such a pain. I feel like I'm constantly pulling out my phone to adjust the lights or shouting voice commands over the TV volume. So I set up an automation that when something is playing, the lights automatically turn off. And then when it's paused, the lights turn back on to a dim setting. Now this is a solid automation and I wanted to try it for myself, but because I've been working on the heuristics for a while, it felt like something was slightly off, but I didn't want to be that guy, right? Nitpicking over trivial details. So I just kept it pushing. But then I saw this video from Brett Tech. All right, we're testing this in real time. We got the office here. We have the dining room light, the living room light. We're going to hit play. And the lights shut off, all of the blinds start to close, and we are ready to consume some media. This is so sick. We're full blackout, that works so well. Now check us out, I added the inverse to that. So if I pause, get up to grab a drink or something, all of the lights turn on, and then I play again to watch TV, and all the lights turn off. This is so dope, this is such a good practical automation. And again, a solid creative improvement to this automation. But since Brett took this automation over the top, the subtle flaw that I noticed from before became more obvious. And now I was curious, what would I learn if I applied the heuristics to this automation? And I learned quite a fair bit. But wait, hold on. Pause the video and I want you to write in the comments what you think the issue is, if any at all. This way, you can kind of compare your answer to the heuristics. And if the heuristics does surprise you or seems valuable, consider subscribing. Okay, so this type of exploration and discovery I would do typically behind the scenes in private and once everything is ironed out, I would create like a video to post it here. However, my Discord squad gets access to these fickle thoughts that kind of run through my mind and they get to see like the raw findings and even get to discuss like the things that I find along the way. So here's a sneak peek into one of those videos.
videos. All right, so you guys remember the previous video where I showed you the smart home heuristics and I mentioned two creators, Reed and Brett, and they created an automation where when they turned on and off or paused or played their Apple TV, it would trigger automations like dimming or turning on the lights and closing their blinds and such. For those automations, I kind of hypothesized that there are times when you don't want those actions to run. If you are, let's say have kids or having guests or whatever the case is, you're not gonna want those automations to trigger every single time. Sometimes you just want the environment to stay the way that you have it. As a result, I basically made the claim that this kind of violates one of the rules. That In the video, I go into detail as to why it passes the first four principles and why it fails the fifth. And I even go into how it helped me evolve the heuristics even further. If you're interested in being part of the squad with exclusive access to these discoveries and joining the conversation, click the link in the description. But that aside, right, here's an abridged version of what I learned. At the time, I only had five principles. The assistant, insider knowledge, anti-ambiguous, fail safe, all or nothing. The automations from both Reed and Brett Tech passed the first four, but it failed the last one, all or nothing. Now, this principle states that if an automatic automation isn't 100% useful 100% of the time, then you probably need to be able to opt in or out of the experience. I know that sounds really drastic, but bear with me, it, it means something. Now, in the automation's current form, it would fire during the day or night, which would be wasteful at best and highly inconvenient at worst. Imagine if you're watching a movie at 11 p.m. and you pause a movie to get a snack and then the window blinds open up and all the lights turn on. This is something that may be a bit of a high inconvenience and kind of creepy to be honest, but you could probably solve it using conditions, but realistically there's evidence to show that it doesn't. And I'll link to that video here, here. There we go, here. <laughs> but that kind of bears a question then, how would you fix this? And again, I want you to pause the video and put your answer in the comments. I like reading your ideas and uh, let's just, just compare, man. Let's just see what happens. Now, the all or nothing principle suggests that you have to allow users to opt in or out of an experience. However, the process should not violate the other principles. Now, this ruled out triggers such as notifications and NFCs and allowed for things like buttons and possibly voice commands. Now, you might be wondering, why can't you use an NFC? Like what's wrong with notifications? And working through these scenarios, this kind of helped me to stumble upon the sixth principle of accessibility. NFCs require that A, your users have to be on your network or at the very least, like the users have to be a registered user within your smart home. Like for instance, the home assistant app or some kind of equivalent. Furthermore, right, the NFC must exist somewhere in the house. So where do you put it? Perhaps maybe the most convenient place you could put it is on the remote, but really realistically like that's kind of tacky guys but i mean like you could do it like there's nothing wrong with doing it and no judgment here but even if we had the nfc sticker on the remote like anyone looking at it would wonder like what is this and what does this do like this would only be useful for you sure you can inform your family but at the end of the day it's kind of something pretty niche that you would do to put it lightly it's ambiguous and inaccessible by most now notifications would pass the anti-ambiguous principle but it would fail the accessibility portion because who would get this notification how? Furthermore, I personally didn't like that I need to have my phone in order to make any of these automations work. Part of like the finesse of Reed's automation was that you didn't have to do anything else besides from just press play or pause on the TV, which was really convenient and nice. But the creation of the sixth principle made me take a closer look at voice triggers. By itself, using the voice commands would fail the insider knowledge heuristic. My family or guests wouldn't know or remember any of the commands for something as niche as that. But the accessibility principle says that an automation can make itself known to a user if they can take advantage of it. So then what if I paired the ease of use from the original automation, but combined it with the voice messaging that can announce to users what they can do? It's currently asleep. So uh, when I turn it on, this is what happens. You can disable the auto theater lights by saying into the remote, disable theater lights. So it gives me instructions as to like what I can do with this remote. It's telling me that I can disable the theater lights. 
uh, by just saying disable theater lights. Out of all the smart home automations I've seen on YouTube, I don't think I've ever encountered an experience where the home would help users take advantage of its features. Making this work was really simple. Using Homebridge, I installed Apple TV's enhanced plugin. Thanks, Brett, for putting me onto this plugin. <laughs> And, and with it, I can trigger HomeKit automations whenever I turn on the TV. A webhook is triggered and Home Assistant will play a message on the living room speaker, letting whoever is watching the TV know what actions they can take. And, and what's nice about using Home Assistant is that I can control when that automation gets to get triggered. In this case, right, I'm only localizing it to the evening times, but you can tailor it to fit your needs. Now to enable and disable the remote from affecting the lights, I created a toggle in Home Assistant and called it Auto Theater Light lights and use the HomeKit bridge to make the switch appear in Apple Home. And now that I have all the pieces to build an automation in HomeKit, this is what I did. I first created a scene that enables and disables the auto theater light switch. So, and by creating a scene, we're able to actually toggle it using our voices on Apple TV so I can use a remote. And lastly, I created an automation just like how Reed does on his channel, except I included the condition to only allow the lights to toggle when the auto theater lights were enabled. Let's see what happens. Oh, oh, look at, put that there. All right, let's just choose one. Now, when I play it, rude, skip, skip. Everything turned off, everything turned off. And then when I pause it, everything turns back on now all right disable theater lights all right so now it's disabled so watch when i play it now i'm playing it they're still on everything is still on but Enable theater lights. Now it's enabled. I play it. Meh. There we go. With all this, all the principles are met and the automation is still convenient and useful to anyone who watches the TV. Now, did the smart home heuristics improve the automation? And what about the problem that you guessed at the beginning? Could you have solved this even without using the heuristics or come to that conclusion? And if so, how would you have solved it? I'm really interested in hearing all of your responses. So please type away and let me know. If you would like to learn more about the heuristics, I have a link in the description that will take you to the blog post where I list all of them and and it goes into detail as to how they all work. And if you want to be a part of the conversation and make an impact, consider joining the squad. When I first created the heuristics, I had five of them, but as you saw, going through this exercise revealed a sixth one. And when I approached the Discord with it, McCreeny Ramblin, I, I really hope I said your name right, bro. He thoughtfully found a seventh one that the other six didn't quite address. Now, I'm not looking to create a bunch more rules, but I do know that as the smart home space evolves, I do expect these principles may need some tweaking, so having more eyes on it definitely does help. Until then, subscribe if you found this video enlightening and watch this next one.